Oh, okay, right. So I will give some general introduction of how to make sense of this uh, uh, new type of causal structure, and then you will have two options if you want to know some detail of how you can get some practical advantage and things that you can actually do in the lab uh, from causal structure, or if you want to get some uh, uh, some very uh, general notion, this will not involve any hardcore uh, quantum gravity theory, but some general idea of how this notion of uh, uh, indefinite causal structure arises uh, in uh, in combination with general relativity. So I leave this up here. It will get erased when I fill up, get to the, the third board. But then tomorrow we can take a vote and uh, and you will uh, get to decide uh, uh, what to cover. So um, to, to very, very briefly summarize what we've seen in the... Uh, Oh, I thought someone called. Oh, okay. <laughs> so to quickly summarize what we have gone through in the morning, I introduced some uh, uh, picture formalism to describe states and transformations. So uh, the take-home message, this is essentially uh, a way to formalize quantum circuits. So everything you can uh, know about quantum circuits is the same. Uh, the, the crucial uh, key extra elements are these two objects which I rewrite for the case of qubits. And you can, uh, uh, you can extend to arbitrary dimensional systems. So this is a, a preparation, sorry, this is not normalized, and you can normalize it if you want uh, uh, a physical state. And then this is the bra. And then the, uh, the crucial trick of the pictorial rule is this uh, Yankin property. So this is, uh, uh, this is uh, in a nutshell, uh, what we've seen. Uh, before, before going on to the next step, I want to introduce just one more uh, um, element, which is uh, uh, some uh, general notion of, uh, of a quantum theory that is used uh, essentially everywhere. So I've, I've introduced the, uh, the formalism for a pure and mixed states. Um, uh, we'll go through some example and, and see how to use one and the other. Uh, the key thing that uh, is good to know uh, is that whenever you're talking about uh, mixed states, and so, so uh, density matrices and transformation of density matrices uh, and measurements, uh, you can always, in fact, think of uh, uh, everything happening for a pure state uh, involving an extra environment. So this is a crucial uh, aspect of quantum theory, which goes under the name of dilation or purification. It means that everything mixed can be purified to an extra system. Uh, and so in a pictorial notation, I will just draw the pictures. And now these will be pictures that refer to, uh, to mixed states, not pure states. Any uh, state rho on a quantum system can be seen as uh, the partial trace of a pure state uh, on two systems. So this means if I have, you have a system in the lab and uh, it's mixed, it doesn't have full information, you can always think that there is a pure state uh, involving some environment degree of freedom and you just don't know the environment. And the fact that it, your state is mixed always arises in this way. This is not trivial because remember, uh, I introduced mixed state as, a, for example, arising from classical ignorance. What this is saying is that uh, even if you have classical ignorance, you can actually represent this state as a, a pure state with no classical ignorance except the fact that you are ignoring a, a part of the environment. Uh, the same works for transformations. If you have a, a trace preserving map, remember these are uh, uh, the physical transformations that can happen with probability one. Uh, you can always uh, 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 think that this is actually a unitary transformation happening on uh, your system and on some environment. And the environment is prepared in some pure state and then uh, discarded. So again, everything happening on the, on the mixed states, you can think as a, this a pure transformation on the expanded Hilbert space. And uh, the final thing, uh, um, well, I will maybe uh, repeat later uh, uh, as we go through what are uh, instruments. I will just uh, uh, briefly tell you the, the pictorial thing. Um, if you are now doing a measurement, remember a measurement is uh, uh, a map uh, that correspond to some uh, particular outcome. So this is something trace preserving means it can happen with probability one. This can happen with some probabilities. You can always think of this as, uh, um, again, taking a larger system, applying a unitary transformation uh, that makes your uh, system of interest interact with an environment. 
and then making a projective measurement on an environment. Um, maybe I will not go too much in the detail, but just conceptually uh, know that every time we talk about uh, a general uh, measurement procedure, we can think of it in this way. We are uh, letting uh, our system interact with some probe. The probe was uh, prepared in some state, and then we measure the probe. Okay? So this is just to know that uh, uh, it's always possible to move from uh, uh, mixed to pure state at the cost of adding more degrees of freedom. This is something that is uh, uh, quite uh, underlying a lot of the theory uh, the, of quantum theory, so it's, it's really good to know. Uh, okay, any question? So that I will uh, move to the next part. Okay, so for the next part, uh, um, and in fact, uh, until the end, uh, I will say that there are actually um, two ways in which you can uh, use uh, these lectures I'm going to present. And one is just look at the picture, and the other is uh, um, um, write down a bit of more of the formulas and of the math. So I think even just looking at the pictures, so I hope uh, you get that the pictures have some very clear uh, physical interpretation of system that gets prepared and transformed. So this will give you uh, still a, a good uh, a good overview of what I'm talking about. But then there is always a mathematical side that will be useful if you want to actually get into the field and uh, and do some uh, uh, some calculation. Uh, but I will uh, I will mostly uh, draw pictures and then uh, only a few times uh, write the corresponding equation. So for the next part, uh, I want to start to uh, challenge this idea that. Uh, um, the best way to, to consider physics is uh, uh, as a description of things that evolve in time. And I, will, uh, I want to challenge it with a, a very simple example. So say that uh, uh, you go to a web website that uh, wants to predict uh, weather forecast. Okay, so you want to know uh, if it's going to rain or not tomorrow. And the typical website will give you some probability for rain. And uh, uh, what you can get is the probabilities uh, for, uh, for different time of the day. So for example, say that uh, uh, the website, it tells you that the probability for rain between uh, 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. is, uh, say, 50%. Well, let's, let's write it as one half. And then say that the probability of rain between 10 and 11 a.m. is one half. And now you go to the website, you get this information, and then I ask you the following question. What is the probability that there is some rain between 9 and 11? Okay, so you have the information, uh, probability between 9 and 10, probability between 10 and 11. So now the question, what is the probability between 9 and 11? Anybody, any idea? Um, 3 over 4, okay, let's, let's list some, some, uh, some answers. Someone says 3 over 4. Any other, uh, someone, someone says 1 half. Any other idea? Could it be one? Huh? No, it cannot be one. Why not? Huh? It could be one. Okay, the trick is that this information is not really enough to answer this question. And this is the crucial thing that I want to, to tell you. So, uh, especially coming from a physics background, but I think probably also from a computer science background, we get the feeling is that uh, if we are told something for each instant of time, this immediately implies uh, the description for the entirety of time. And now this is not the, not, it's not right, because there are different scenarios, different situations, in which I could have one half, one half, uh, but will correspond to different probabilities for the entire time. For example, imagine that the prediction is that there is a, uh, for certainty, there is a cloud that is going to rain, uh, and you just don't know if it's going to rain uh, the first half of the day or the second half of the day. So for example, you have a big perturbation, it's coming through, you're knowing it's going to rain for sure, but you just don't know when it's going to pass through. So in that case, uh, uh, the total probability is one, but then you might be uncertain when it's actually coming through. And so, so then maybe you have one half, one half probability. Another situation, it could be that maybe uh, the two times are completely independent. 
So maybe uh, you have some rain, and for each hour, there is some probability that it's going to rain, and then the next hour, completely unrelated, there is also some probability. And in that case, actually, you will get one over four, which which is something that uh, nobody, uh, nobody wrote. So it could be that uh, the probability will just be the product. Um, sorry, no, um, that is not right. Um, will be, um, well, it doesn't matter. So the, uh, uh, why three over four, who said this one? Why was that? What was the interpretation? Uh-huh. All right, yes, okay, thank you. So that's actually what I was saying, and that's the correct answer, <laughs> not one over four. So if the probability, if you have probability one half that it will not rain, uh, the, so you have four possible events, rain, 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 not rain, not rain, rain, and the, if, if they're all independent, and uh, each with probability one half, then all the combination have probability one over four. And then the probability that it rains, uh, at least one of the two hours is three over four, and the probability that it doesn't rain ever is one over four. The point is that uh, uh, what is missing in those two, in this information, is the correlations between these two variables. So essentially, we have two variables. We have the probability distribution for some variable at time one and some variable at time two. And uh, uh, this information is partial information, which means is the marginal of these two variables. So when you have a joint probability distribution, the marginal means, uh, so you have two variables A and B. Uh, if you have a joint probability distribution, you can always calculate the marginal, what is the probability just for A, the probability just for B. And the rule is that uh, the probability, say X, C1, is equal to the sum of all the value, uh, even, I'm writing big because uh, I know it's hard to, to see, but maybe it's getting too big. So the probability for rain at time one, it will be the sum of all the options at time two, x c1 comma x c2 over x. So if you have the joint probability, if you know the probability of all combination, rain, 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 not rain, not rain, rain, and not rain, not rain. Then you can also calculate the marginal probability, what is just the probability to see rain the first hour, which will be given by taking the probability for rain and then summing with all the option for the variable you don't care about, right? So, so this is the marginal, and the point is that uh, if you know, if you have information on the two marginals, it doesn't give you full information about the full probability because you can have correlation, right? So, so this is to say that uh, uh, when you think about uh, uh, a, uh, a situation uh, that evolves in time, that uh, uh, you can make observation at different points in time, uh, in general, it's not right that uh, uh, you can think of it as uh, uh, something evolving in time. In particular, you cannot think of, uh, of these scenarios describing as a probability distribution evolving in time. What you should think about is the joint probability for the observations are all, at all different times. So this is how in... Uh, in classical physics, you, descri you describe stochastic processes. A stochastic process is a joint probability distribution for observation that you can make at all different times. Is this convincing, this argument? Okay, so now what uh, uh, has been uh, a puzzle uh, in uh, quantum theory, and in fact, it's a puzzle that was already solved uh, uh, some 60 years ago, but many people didn't, didn't know, and then, uh, Every two or three, three every uh, two or three years, there is someone again solving this puzzle just because it's not widely known, and so everybody realizes how to do it. But so the puzzle was uh, um, how to describe uh, open quantum systems. So open quantum systems are exactly um, a scenario like in uh, um, like for weather, where we never we are not actually describing a, a, um, a system with the full information, so with pure state but where we have a, a system where uh, there could be noise, and so we can uh, possibly look at our system at different possible times. And, uh, um, and essentially, we want to have the analogous, uh, uh, the quantum version of a, a stochastic process. So a stochastic process is joint probability across time. Uh, while the way people often describe quantum system is as a, as a density matrix evolving in time. 
Now, for the same reason as uh, this doesn't give you full information, a uh, density matrix evolving in time doesn't give you full information because uh, uh, this density matrix only tells you uh, about probability if you make a measurement at a certain time. But now if you make two measurements, one at time one and one at time two, there could be correlations, and, uh, and this description doesn't really encode those correlations. Okay, so um, uh, what I want to tell you about for the next hour or so is uh, how to uh, describe open systems. So how to give a description of uh, um, systems evolving in time, possible with noise and uh, with correlations with the environment. A and effectively how to generalize this uh, uh, classical notion of, of stochastic maps. And we will see that, uh, well, essentially, uh, I will not delve into a lot of details. Uh, we can go into more details tomorrow um, in the problem solving session where I will uh, uh, the task will be to make one calculation for a, a particular example of, of this uh, situation. Um, okay, so let's start with uh, something uh, simple. Let's say that uh, um, I have a system and I just measure it twice. So now there isn't really anything going on between the, the first and the second time I, I measure it. I just measure it and then I measure it again and nothing happens in the middle. So how do we calculate the joint probability? So now keep in mind that now the uh, uh, the crucial perspective shift is that we are not anymore thinking about things that evolve in time. Eventually, we want to have a, a sort of black block picture where we have a, a whole scenario where there is a measurement time one, time two, and then we want to join probability. But let's start with the with the um, description, where, uh, uh, which is the most familiar, and for the case where, uh, uh, where it actually works. So we have our state. We measure it the first time, and then we measure it the first, second time. We want to know the, the joint probability distribution. So first of all, I will uh, uh, repeat uh, how is the measurement described. When we want to, so now we, when we uh, uh, talk about the measurement, we need to know uh, how the state is prepared after the measurement. So I will repeat uh, uh, how this is described, which I, I already introduced uh, 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 in the morning, but uh, I will. Um, I will go through it again. So uh, the description is a collection of, uh, of completely positive maps where the label represents the measurement outcome. So I can get a measurement, can get outcome 0, 1, 2, 3. For each outcome corresponds one measurement, uh, one, uh, one transformation. And this has to have the property that uh, if I take the sum of all of those, and then I take the trace applied to some state is equal to the trace of row. And I promise that I will do it with pictures. So I will actually just do it with pictures. So this is the condition. Uh, so essentially, uh, the intuition here is, is the following. I'm, uh, uh, I have a state. I measure it. And there is some outcome. Now, if I sum over all the outcome, it means I'm ignoring the actual outcome. And then if I'm not actually looking at the state anymore, it's as if I'm just ignoring the state, right? I get a state, someone measure it, doesn't tell me the outcome and doesn't give me the state, it's as if they, they didn't give me anything. So this is the intuitive picture, this, this final, uh, uh, um, final trace, so this is a ground uh, symbol, just means that the system is, uh, is ignored at the end. So this, this gives you the, the condition that these maps have to satisfy. Maybe to, um, um, well, I can repeat the example uh, that I gave uh, uh, at the beginning, just uh, maybe to connect with the, something you are a bit more familiar with. So maybe I can stress that uh, typically, uh, if you're introduced to quantum theory and uh, you're, uh, uh, there is a discussion of what is the state after the measurement, there is some discussion about, about collapse, about, uh, uh, the fact that after uh, the, the state is measured, uh, then something dramatic happens, the state collapses. Um, so we should think of, uh, of this transformation as, uh, as more of an um, information update. So we have some description of our state. After we, we make the measurements, we have a new description. Um, and uh, the example is uh, if we start, uh, so if we do some simple projective measurement, which is uh, um, described by the two states, 0, 0, 1, 1, which means we take our state and then we measure uh, our measurement uh, uh, tells us that we see either 0 or 1. Then a typical uh, um, 
measurement, which is called the von Neumann measurement, will uh, reprepare if you start from a state rho and then you say state zero. If you measure zero, it will reprepare it in uh, state zero, but renormalize. So renormalize in the sense you multiply by the projection of, uh, of uh, uh, by the expectation value of rho with the state zero. And the renormalization is important because uh, say this is the result of the map zero. Uh, we always have that the probability to observe zero is equal to the trace of M zero rho, which in this case, uh, the trace of zero is zero, so this is zero rho zero. So you see that this is just, uh, um, uh, so this is the ordinary bone rule. They will just, will just say, if you measure a state, the probability uh, to get zero is given by this expectation value. This we, uh, we have a bit more complete description. We don't just tell you the probability, we tell you what is the state afterwards. So this is important because now if we are making two measurements, then it's simple enough. Basically, we have to take rho, then apply our first map, then we apply our second map. mj, and then we take the trace. And this gives us our joint probability, probability ij. Okay, so this is very simple. You take your state, you apply the first map, you apply the second map, you take the trace, this gives you the joint probability for both outcomes. Okay? So now, of course, you can, uh, um, you can do more complicated things. So, for example, you can have some evolution in the middle. So you take your state, you measure it once, you measure it, and then you have some trace preserving map. Remember, trace preserving map is something that happens, doesn't correspond to any measurement outcome. You can imagine it's happening in the background. And then uh, you have uh, the second measurement, and then you trace out, and this gives you the probability for uh, A and J. So this is a, 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 tempor a temporal description ag uh, again. So what we, we do, basically, we start from uh, the description of our state, it's a density metric. We apply all the operators uh, that represents either the um, non-deterministic transformation for a particular outcome or a deterministic transformation. We compose everything, we take the trace, and this final number is our joint probability. And just to check that the joint probability is normalized, we want that sum over ij, tij is equal to one. And now, uh, in graphical terms, we have uh, these two boxes. Uh, I will now skip a bit of the details. Here I'm, I'm just, uh, imagine that there is rho m, e, m. I'm just being a bit, uh, bit lazy. So if we take the sum over uh, i and j, because these uh, uh, expressions are all linear, we can uh, uh, sum over i here and sum over j here. And remember the main uh, property of, uh, of an instrument, which is uh, the, um, the representation of, uh, of measurements. I rewrite it here because I, I deleted it. Is that if we sum all over, uh, over all the outcomes and then we take the trace, we can uh, remove the whole thing. And so you see now that uh, here we sum over all the outcomes, so we can remove this whole thing because we are taking the trace. Now this, we just, uh, uh, was just saying that was some background evolution, so it's also trace preserving. So also when we take the trace, we remove all the trace. We're again uh, uh, removing all the outcomes here, so again this is all trace preserving. So this applies directly to our state, and if our initial state is a density matrix, so it's trace one, this whole thing is equal to one. Okay, so that's how you, you can describe in, uh, say, ordinary terms, ter um, temporal terms, the fact that you have uh, a state, evolution, evolution, and then uh, different measurements, and then uh, you, you take the joint probability. And again, note that uh, um, the typical uh, description will be uh, a bit more cumbersome, because we will tell you, you take the state, and then uh, um, somehow you have to collapse the state, and then you get a normalized state, and then you have to somehow calculate some conditional probabilities. The typical thing will... Uh, will be a bit more complicated. Well, here is one expression that gives you the, uh, the whole joint probability. So, okay, next step is uh, the case uh, um, as in the weather. 
where there could be some correlations between what happens at the different time steps. So physically, what does it mean that there are correlations? It means that uh, uh, now your system row is uh, uh, a part of a bigger system. So when you do your first measurement, uh, you're doing it on, on a system, but it's actually initially correlated, so it's part of a, of a bigger system that involves some environment. And then you do your measurement MI. And then it could be that uh, uh, your environment interacts again with your system. So this is a, a general picture of, uh, um, of an open quantum system where you have your environment and then your environment comes in and uh, interacts with, uh, um, with your system. And uh, it can happen multiple times, but here we are just considering the, uh, the case of two uh, measurements. So the situation now is uh, we have uh, um, this general description and we could imagine that this is actually a pure state because uh, we know that we can always, uh, if we include an environment, we can always describe uh, anything as a pure state. Then we could imagine this is a unitary evolution because again, any, uh, if we include an environment, any transform, any evolution can be described as a unitary. And then we have to trace away the environment and you also have to trace away uh, the result of the second measurement. And so this again gives you the, uh, the probability, the joint probability for A, I, and J in the case uh, uh, where your, uh, your system is interacting with an environment. Okay, so, so note that uh, uh, to keep track, in this case, to keep track of possible correlation between the first and second time step, it's really important uh, to include this environment. So to make an example, and uh, again, I will just make pictures. It could be that your environment is in a maximally entangled state. I ignore normalization here, but imagine there is always a one over D if it's an actual state. Then I make my first measurement. And then as, a, um, as an interaction, as an example, it could be just a swap. So uh, my environment becomes the system, my system goes into the environment and I trace it away. And then I measure again. And so now you can see, and it will be quite intuitive, so you have that uh, after I make the first measurement, my environment and my system get swapped. And so this is it's quite intuitive, and you can see it by rearranging the picture, that this is the same as just uh, making two measurements on uh, this maximal entangled state. And again, it's, uh, uh, remember that uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this graphical formalism, once you have a, a, a graph without any loose arrows, which represents a number, and for an open system, this number is actually the probability, uh, these graphs are in fact invariant under arbitrary uh, rearranging of the wires. And uh, the basic properties was this Yankee that I was showing, and uh, well, it's, it's quite intuitive to, to see that uh, uh, for this swap, that's that's also the case, but, but just take it as a, as a rule that uh, essentially once uh, your graph is just a number without any external legs, then you can do any rearrangement and this will give you the same number. So in this case, we have a situation where we were describing uh, two time steps, but for this particular interaction is the same as making two measurements on two sides of a system. Okay, so this is an example. Uh, maybe uh, the, the conceptual thing to draw attention on is that it's an example where we have uh, an equivalent of uh, something that happens at two steps in time with something that happens at one time, but uh, on two separate uh, systems. So this is something that uh, already gives a hint that uh, uh, we can get some formalism which uh, generalizes causal structures. But I, I will get into more detail uh, tomorrow about that. Any questions so far? Okay, so, so now the point is the following. We have these, uh, um, some rules coming from quantum mechanics of how to calculate uh, things by keeping track of time. So this problem that I was saying at the beginning, uh, you can have correlation between uh, the first time and the second time. In principle, we can always deal with it by appropriately uh, describing an interaction with an environment and then we still have the, the picture of things evolving in time, but we have to keep track of this environment. And now uh, it would be good if we could have a, a bit uh, uh, more compact representation. So 
remember, a stochastic process is just a joint probability distribution for all your uh, variables at different times. And it doesn't necessarily have to give you a description of interaction with the environment. That can be also in the classical case a valid description. You get some deterministic function with the environment. But it's really useful if you can work with something that only, only acts on the, on the system of interest. Uh, and so, so the thing is to understand that what is this object? What is the, um, the object that represents um, the entire uh, history or the entire um, uh, possible correlation that you can have uh, when you make different measurements? Uh, and now the, uh, the thing again is, is doing some, uh, uh, some pictorial uh, uh, steps uh, to, to get what is the system we want to talk about. What is the, the thing we want to talk about? So essentially what I want to do is uh, to get to a definition of uh, a quantum stochastic process. And again, this was something that uh, it was known by Lindblad and uh, Accardi and other people in the 60s, but everybody, essentially everybody uh, ignores it, apart a couple of groups like uh, people at Monash University and us and well, it's something that it can be really useful to know if you want to work in this, uh, in this field. Um, so let's, um, let's first of all uh, uh, write this picture in a slightly more compact form. So you see that, uh, um, well, let's write these things in this way. We have, uh, um, uh, I will write. And now imagine this can go on for, uh, for a multiple time and then eventually we have to trace out everything. Um, actually, let's, let's look at the, at the simplest case first. So let's look just at the simplest case where we have a system, we do a measurement. Well, okay, the simplest case is still with two because otherwise it isn't really anything. And, okay. and then uh, if, if that's all we are going to do, then we, we trace out here. If we are going to make more measurements, this goes on. So let's, let's trace this out for, uh, for now. Uh, so now what, uh, what uh, uh, I want to stress is that uh, uh, if we look at this expression, how uh, it appears, well, nowhere, but, uh, but essentially remember that uh, all these lines mean, uh, correspond to, um, to, um, to partial traces, to, to linear operations, to operations on a linear space. So what you can uh, see in particular is that uh, um, uh, all this expression will always be linear in uh, your map. So maybe a, a way to easily see it is that, uh, imagine you have, you have uh, uh, some, um, some operation here, and you have some probability for, uh, uh, for uh, some M0, and some probability for uh, M1. Now, if you want to, do, to, to know what is the probability that either zero or one happens, this clearly will be the sum of the two. But uh, um, in the same way that uh, um, if you recall, uh, probabilistic mixture for states are described by convex combination. Also in the case of maps, um, these will be, will be described by sums. So the, the point that I want to make is that all these, uh, uh, all these um, probabilities, and in general, all these uh, uh, pictures represent linear transformations. So now the crucial object that we want to know is uh, the joint probability for uh, uh, the map at the first time and the map at the second time. And let me write some label A and B just to distinguish first and second time. We can imagine that these are two players that are playing some game and they're making some measurement. This is some, a language that is common in information theory. Uh, so Alice makes a measurement and then Bob makes a measurement. So this is some probability for uh, M, A, I, and M, B. J. So the, the stochastic process really is the probability. So it's something that uh, uh, the probability distribution, something that if you, if you give me the two uh, maps, it gives, gives out a number which is the probability. Um, so to, uh, to represent this, I will first rewrite this in a, in a slightly different way. M, I, and B. So essentially, I, I write this as something that acts on A and B. 
So essentially this, this picture here is a compact representation of uh, this external wire and uh, these interactions. So now what, what is called the process, I will, I will give you a bit more details, but in dictionary terms, the process is just uh, whatever is not the operations. So uh, co conceptually, the operations are what we are doing to test our system. We can make a measurement at time one, at time two. And now we want to have uh, something that describes anything that the environment is doing. So the environment is something, what is doing is described by uh, whenever we feed in our operations, it gives us a probability. And so picturally, it has to be uh, something uh, of this form. So, so essentially, I, I take this picture and I, I remove uh, uh, the operations I'm doing, and I'm left uh, with this compact representation. So uh, mathematically, what this uh, represents is a bilinear function on, on those two maps. OK, I see some uh, bit lost faces, so maybe I will. Uh, um, I will step out of picture for a second to, to show how, how this makes sense. So uh, the general scenario here is that I'm starting with some system row AB, which is our uh, uh, sorry, row A, A environment. So the system on uh, joint system on what we are interested in and the environment. Then we make some measurements on the, on the system and leave the environment alone. So leave the environment alone, it means we, we are doing uh, identity on the environment. Uh, and for now, and I will remove the, the labels I and J, just uh, remember that this is one of many possible outcomes. Then I compose with some evolution on both system and environment, in particular it can be unitary. And then I compose again with the measurement done on the system and nothing on the environment. And then I take the trace. So this is, uh, 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 this is our uh, expression for a probability on uh, A and B. Okay, so now, uh, maybe this is not completely obvious, but again, what I want to stress is that this expression is linear in both A and B. So if we take this expression for uh, MA1 and MA2, A1 plus MA2, and B, this is equal to the sum of the two. And that's because uh, all we are doing is uh, taking tensor product and function composition, and these are all linear functions, and so they end up, uh, and, and taking traces, so these are all end up in, uh, in linear functions. Uh, and B plus B and A2. And B, right? And uh, uh, um, so this means it's additive, and uh, and it's also linear if we multiply uh, one of these for uh, by a, um, a scalar. This scalar will just go out of the expression. So if we have P of uh, M A Q M B, this is just equal to Q P M A M B. Are you happy with this, or is it? So is the uncertainty of why this means it's linear, or uh, is it uncertainty on why should we care about it? Huh? Huh? You mean it's not clear why this is linear? It's clear. Huh? Trace, uh, yes, trace is linear operator. Tensor product is also linear of it, in each of these arguments. And function compo composition is also linear. So the, uh, the reason it's important that, uh, that this is linear is because uh, uh, remember uh, when we talk about work on the space of uh, operators and mixed states, then uh, um, uh, linear combinations or more particular convex combination represent probabilistic mixtures. So that's why uh, it's important uh, um, that it's linear because uh, um, physically what it means is that if we ask the probability for uh, uh, a probabilistic mixture of objects, this is, uh, um, so if we ask the probability, uh, so if we have some transformation that we know with some probability it's transformation one or transformation two, then uh, the corresponding probability should be equal to um, uh, 
the corresponding combination, so let's say probability of uh, M1 plus M2. So, or, or maybe to say in other words, uh, an expression of this type represents a transformation that is uh, M1 with probability one or M2 with probability two. And so it's important that if you want uh, a probability for uh, M, which is this combination, it should be, uh, uh, the probability should be P1 times the probability for this times P2, the probability for this. So the whole thing has to be linear. But, but explicitly, you can take the general expression and just sh see that uh, the, the thing is a linear function. So why am I stressing this? Because uh, uh, the point is that conceptually now what uh, uh, we are interested in is uh, um, exactly the, uh, the generalization of classical stochastic processes. Remember, a classical stochastic process is a joint probability for a variable at different times. And now that's exactly what we have. So we have a, a joint probability for variables at different times. So maybe I rewrite over here. If now we put back a time label, we have MT1, MT2, and so on. So the crucial thing to realize is that the uh, quantum version of a, a stochastic variable is this uh, uh, completely positive map. So the completely positive map is something that arises as a description of how um, states get transformed uh, when we make a measurement. But now we have this general structure that uh, uh, if we want to talk about um, some time that uh, some process where we can have uh, um, measurements at different points in time, the joint probability uh, is given by a function on all the completely positive map. So picturally, oops. So picturally, that's exactly how, how we represent it. So a, a function is something that uh, essentially the process is, uh, uh, is taking our temporal description and then taking out uh, our map. So remember that if we have no lines around, we have a probability. So this means that now we, we have an object that's such that when we plug in the measurements at different times, we get something without any error around, which is our probability. So the, uh, the process itself is, uh, uh, is this picture here, which represents uh, a linear map on a different, um, uh, on different uh, uh, measurement operate on different um, completely positive map. So say this is time one. So if you want to, uh, to consider a process for many times, this will be naturally some uh, object of this type. So this is something, uh, so this is an object which uh, its interpretation is that uh, if you give the object a description of uh, a measurement at time one, at time two, at time three, you plug it in and the object gives you back a number, which is the joint probability for uh, uh, observing these measurements at time one, time two, time three. Any question? So, okay, how much time do we have? So, um, uh, so we have until 4.40, so we have, or 4.50, so we have a half an hour. So yes, we have time to go through this. Okay, so this might sound a bit abstract, but so let's, say, let's take this as an abstract definition. Maybe we can just uh, try to systematize. So a quantum event, quantum event, by definition, is a CP map, completely positive map, M from some, uh, uh, well, I will describe what all these things mean, from some input space to some uh, output space. So H means a Hilbert space. L of H means the space of linear operators. So for example, density operators live in L of H. And so maps are uh, uh, functions that uh, map uh, operators to operators. Sometimes they're called super maps because an operator itself is a map and these are, are super operators. They map operators to operators. And uh, uh, to be completely general, the dimension of this input space and the dimension of the output space in general could be different. To make things simpler, we can imagine it the same dimension. So maybe this is always a qubit, so the input and output is uh, um, 
is just a, um, they are all qubit spaces. And now an event, uh, uh, sorry, a, a process uh, or a quantum process. So if you want to know what is a quantum process for a certain number of events, so let's say for uh, uh, events A, B, and so on, this is a, a multilinear multi function. that takes a uh, um, quantum events, so MA, MB, and so on, a collection of quantum events, and maps it into a number omega, MA, MB, and so on. Um, so multilinear, it means that it's linear in each of its entries. Um, and uh, um, and this will have a, a, a few properties, which, um, so this number is what we interpret as the joint probability distribution for event A, event B, and so on to happen. And for this to be a valid uh, probability distribution, it has to satisfy the following properties, that if uh, M, A, M, B are completely positive, then uh, omega M, A, M, B is positive because uh, it has to be a probability. And then we want that the probabilities are normalized, so when uh, uh, we sum over all possible measurement outcomes, mi, mj, and so on, we get equal to one. Now the second property uh, can also be, uh, so remember this is a multilinear functional, so it means that uh, if we sum, uh, so multilinear, maybe I'll write it here. Multilinear means that if we take sum over j, pj, omega, m, a, uh, i, and so on, we can take inside uh, all the sums. So that's what, so that's what it means to be linear for the first term, and multilinear means it's linear for each of the, uh, uh, for each of, it, of, of its entries. And so because it's multilinear, we can also rewrite the normalization condition as omega sum over i m r a i sum over j m b j equal to one, which is the same as saying, uh, remember these are quantum instruments, they have the property that they sum up to a trace preserving map. So this is same as saying, uh, if we, apply our process to trace preserving maps um, for uh, MA, MB, completely positive and trace preserving. CPTP is short for completely positive and trace preserving. So the, uh, the, the intuition here is that if we ask what is the probability for uh, uh, a bunch of, of uh, transformations and each of these are deterministic transformation, then the total probability must be one. So consider here, so intuitively here we have, uh, what we are doing is that we have these uh, little measurement stations that are at different times. Now if we, uh, instead of doing a measurement, we just do some transformation, then uh, uh, the overall probability is, is just one if we are not actually doing any measurement. While uh, if we are doing some measurements, then uh, we plug in uh, the map that represents our measurement and, uh, um, and this gives us the, uh, the, the total probability. Okay, so this is a bit abstract, but, uh, um, but I hope uh, you get the picture. So we are simply uh, abstracting away. So the, the reason that uh, this is useful is because now this is an object that only lives on, uh, on the system. We don't have to describe the environment explicitly. So this is uh, the direct analog of uh, um, what is an analogy of, uh, of uh, classical stochastic processes, where you have a, a joint probability distribution of events over time. Um, and now for the, uh, the last uh, um, half hour or so, I can uh, uh, tell you a convenient way to represent these processes. So this is a little abstract. We can make it a little more concrete, well, concrete mathematically, uh, 
if you want a concrete physical representation, then you can always think that what this represents is that there is some environment going on in the background and then it can interact and can interact. And these open slots are uh, our station where we do our measurements. Uh, but there is a bit uh, of a simpler uh, mathematical representation that allows us to write this, uh, uh, this process in a way that is more familiar, that is similar to the, uh, to the bone rule where we take uh, density metrics, we take the trace with some operators and that gives us the probability. So that's what I want to do uh, next. So any question about this part? Okay, so uh, let's go forward with that. So the topic of the next part is something called uh, choi yamio koski isomorphism. Choi, I think, is an American or something. Uh, actually, I'm not sure. yamio koski is a Polish uh, name, so I will spell it for you. Yamio-koski. So many people have problems pronouncing this, they will say Jamil, Jamil Kov, Kov. Well, okay, I don't know. So <laughs> this is Polish, so J is a Y, this is a L over, over two, 2 pi, and so L bar is a L, and W is B, so it's Jamiokowski, Jamiokowski. So uh, if it's hard, just say Choi representation, okay? So, so this, uh, uh, this is an isomorphism that allows us to represent uh, completely positive maps as operators. So remember, a, a, a completely positive map is a super operator. It maps operators from operators. So this starts to be a bit abstract because we are going up. We first have a state and then transformation of state and tra transformation of transformation of state starts to be a bit uh, burdensome. So this is a way to, uh, to step it the level down. So we can uh, represent uh, those uh, super operators actually as operators. And so the, the way to, uh, uh, to see it is uh, uh, again uh, introducing this uh, uh, favorite um, pictorial element, which remember is a maximally entangled state. Uh, and now if we, if we have an operator, a super operator M, well, this, uh, this works both for pure and mixed state. I will represent it now for, uh, for mixed state. Uh, we can map this to, uh, so re uh, remember um, something with a leg down and a leg up is something that transforms uh, states. Something with two legs up is actually a bipartite state. Uh, so we can map something with one leg down and one leg up to something with the two legs up. And uh, well, I think the intuition should be easy. We ju just have to bend this line up. So physically, what it means is that we take our super operator and apply it to the maximal entangled state. So, so physically, you can think of this, uh, uh, of this uh, isomorphism as saying, uh, uh, whenever I have a transformation, I can take a bipartite state, maximal entangled, and then I throw, so I have two particles, I throw one particle through this transformation and the other particle I do nothing. And what I end up, I end up with is, uh, again, two particles in some state, and this state is called the Choi uh, operator corresponding to this uh, uh, um, map here. So now it, it might not be clear, but uh, I'm trying to write this uh, M as a calligraphic M, and this is just a block capital M. So uh, the, the definition uh, more mathematically is uh, identity tensor M applied on, uh, well, let me use again this notation here. This is M. If you want to write it down in indices, this is just a sum over I and J, I, J tensor um, M applied on I and J. So this is the definition. Um, okay, so that's just an isomorphism. Uh, why do we care? So there are um, two reasons. One is uh, uh, an important theorem. It tells us that if uh, our map, that our map is completely positive, if and only if its choice representation is positive semi-definite. So now this is kind of intuitive because uh, a positive semi-definite uh, operator represents um, a quantum state. And so when we transform it, 
we get again a positive semi-definite operator, which is again a quantum state. What is not obvious is the other way, that any, any map that has a positive uh, semi-definite operator as its chi representation uh, is also completely positive. So it goes two ways. And, um, and this is an, an isomorphism in the sense every time we have M, we can reconstruct its M, and I will not write the formula, but it's just pictorially we have to bend the line back. And because of this Yankin property uh, that I was telling about, uh, this is the same as the original M. So if you give me a map, uh, I can give you uh, a state that corresponds to the map. If you give me a state, I can reconstruct a map by just uh, applying uh, this projection on the maximal entangled state. Um, right, so why, uh, why is this interesting for representing processes? It's because, uh, um, so now we can, uh, um, we can talk about these, uh, um, all these uh, uh, linear operations instead of uh, being at this higher level uh, of, uh, of maps. Uh, we can uh, do everything at this lower level of operators and things become uh, uh, slightly simpler. Although we have to keep track of doing the uh, isomorphism in the right way, um, it's, it's much simpler to, um, uh, to write it down. So maybe I will, uh, um, I will introduce some uh, extra symbol to, to denote this. Uh, um, this is, um, hmm. I'm not really good at, draw, at drawing this. This should be um, a gothic C. I don't really know how to do it. Um, so let's, let's write it like this. This just, just uh, is a way to say this represents the, the choice uh, the Choi operator corresponds to the map M. Um, so the, the thing that we can see now, for example, is uh, uh, if we make um, map composition, we, I will just state something without proving. Uh, say that we want to, uh, to see how two maps, so this can, this can work both for uh, uh, trace preserving maps or for more general maps. Uh, so say that we have, uh, uh, let's do M and N, that we want to compose two maps. We can ask, uh, how do we get the Choi uh, representation of the composite map from the Choi representation of the two maps? So the Choi of the composite is given by uh, just this whole thing with the line up. And now to, um, to obtain this from the Choi of each of those, we have to uh, get the Choi of this, uh, of the upper map, which we just get by uh, introducing an extra turn in our diagram. So you see that uh, uh, this part here, maybe I should use a different color. So if we make this map, this part here is the Choi of N, because the Choi of the, choi of the operator is the one where we turn the line up. Uh, this part here is the Choi of M. And so essentially the way to get from the Choi of two operators to uh, the Choi of the uh, composition of the two is to join the two Choi with this extra uh, line going up. And uh, um, um, if you remember, uh, uh, bending a line has something to do with transposition, so I will not go into the detail, but I will tell you the final result. So let's say that we call uh, uh, A, I, and B, A, A, O, the input and output space of the first map, and then uh, B, I, and B, O, input and output space of the second map. Um, yeah, so let's just do this for a second. So we have AI, so here we have AI here, AO here, uh, BI, BO. So the rule that, uh, uh, that one can see is that the choice of uh, N composed M is equal to a partial trace on uh, uh, a system E 
So let's call, uh, um, so this is, we are identifying AO and BI, so we put AO equal to BI equal to E of uh, um, M AI E N E B O, and then we have to take a partial trace, a partial transpose uh, over here. Um, sorry, this is uh, capital M and capital N are the choice of M and choice of N. So this is just a formula. Um, I, I don't think you should uh, try to understand deep implications. So what we are doing is that uh, we take these two operators and then uh, we define them on uh, uh, the operator of, of N on a space E and B O, the operator of uh, M on A I and E. So the, these are actually multiplied uh, on E. So maybe if I write things slightly more explicitly, this is A I uh, E tensor identity B O, and then uh, product with the identity A O tensor N B I, uh, sorry, E B O. And uh, um, we take the partial trace over system E uh, and we get our answer. So, okay, this is just to say that there is a rule to, uh, uh, to convert uh, um, combinations between uh, uh, um, uh, composition of matrices into uh, composition of the choice of the respective matrix. So now the final thing maybe, um, well, there is still a bit of time, so I will, I will get to the end and then maybe I will try to walk back if there are questions and, uh, and give some more uh, um, explanations. So the final thing is that uh, if you want to write our uh, uh, stochastic process, so remember our stochastic process is what gives us the joint probability for measurements done at different instance of, the, of time. And now we can rewrite this as a, a trace of tensor product of all the uh, uh, choice operators uh, A I A O times M. Uh, let's say that this is one and this is two. M two B I B O and so on. Find some operator W. So this operator W is what represents, uh, it's not there anymore. So this operator W is what represents what we call as a comb. So it represents everything that is not the operations we are doing in the picture. So it represents this external structure. And uh, M1, M2, and so on represent these maps in the middle. Um, so W represents omega. And then M1, M2 represent um, uh, cursive one, cur cursive M2. And the only thing, again, this is some technical thing, that these are uh, actually the transpose of the choice operator. And uh, the fact that these are the transpose uh, have to do with the fact that the transpose appears when we do composition. So uh, don't worry too much about that, but uh, just know that this is the, um, uh, the right definition. Okay, so. Uh, the, the thing to make stock of is that now we are, we are talking about uh, some process that goes on in time, and we got back to an expression that is very, very similar to the expression that we had to calculate probabilities for just one state and one measurement. So in particular, imagine that you have some state rho, and then you make multiple measurements E1, uh, E1A, E2B, the formula for this is trace of E one A times E two B times rho. So you see that this is really the same formula. It's this is the trace of something that represents. Uh, so the, the physical in interpretation is that we have some object that represents um, our system. In this case, our system was just a state uh, that we want to measure, and then some operators that represents our uh, actual measurement. And that's the thing that goes on, goes on here. We have some uh, operator that represents our uh, uh, now process, or so the external thing we interact with. 
and then some operators that represent our measurement. And the joint probability is given by, uh, by the traits of the uh, measurement operators times the process operator. So exactly like here. So it's exactly the same formula. So there is a, a, a very direct uh, mathematical connection between uh, uh, ordinary quantum mechanics, ordinary bone rule, where you just have one state and you measure it, and uh, uh, a more general scenario where you have uh, a system that you measure multiple times. And, and this is quite, quite powerful because essentially uh, a lot of the things that you know and that you can do using uh, this formula where you have a density matrix and then you make measurements, uh, you can now uh, uh, transfer over here. Uh, the only difference is that uh, uh, these objects satisfy different uh, um, normalization constraints. Um, maybe I will not uh, delve too much in that, but remember that uh, for a density matrix, trace of rho is equal to one. While in this case, uh, remember this has to be uh, um, has to be one whenever we evaluate with the trace per serving map. So this gives some different constraints. Um, uh, so that's. Um, so that's the general introduction to, um, to processes with memory. So the point is that if you want to describe an open system uh, where there could be a memory of an environment is described by some operator. So maybe I will very quickly go and give you some, uh, a couple of examples because maybe then gives a, uh, a little uh, intuition of how to use this, uh, this formalism. So the, uh, the main example is uh, what if you have the, the simple case of a Markovian process? A Markovian process is one where there is actually no memory. And uh, uh, here I will just, again, draw pictures. So remember, uh, this open slot represents the places where we do our measurements. Now, if there is no memory, uh, it means, so remember this, this bulk here represents, um, represents the fact that we could have uh, interaction with the environment. So this is the general case. The case with no memory is uh, uh, the situation where we can actually ignore this line. So the case with no memory is the case where we have some state, and then we have some transformation from time one to time two, some other transformation from time two to time three. And uh, uh, our process in this case is just given by a tensor product. So we have uh, AI. So now we have, uh, um, for each moment in time, we have some input space and output space, which we can take to be the same, but we label them differently just uh, to keep track of things. To be, uh, I, B, o. So, uh, so the fact that this is a product is really a direct combination of, uh, of this representation. So remember that um, a, a product state was just uh, uh, given by putting together uh, two symbols without any connection between the two. That's, a, that's uh, uh, for states, this gives a rho time sigma, something that is just a product without correlation. And so the same is, is true when we go to this higher order. We can still interpret the, uh, the pictures in, in the same way. It's now our, our process is uh, something that uh, uh, is, a, is a bunch of disconnected uh, parts of the graph, and each disconnected part uh, represents one element of this tensor product. So this gives you a direct definition of... Uh, um, of a Markovian process. A Markovian process is something with not, no, without any memory. And, uh, and the intuition is that it's something without any correlation. So you have a, a state at time zero, then a transformation time one, time two, a transformation time two, time three. And all these things are not correlated. So correlations are given when, uh, when your things are not, uh, are not in the product form. So maybe if this is not something not entirely familiar, if you take the probability for say, I and J as the trace. Now think about states, but we have seen that the formula is the same. So think that you have uh, um, your bipartite state and uh, you're making a, a, a joint a, a measurement, uh, a two independent measurements. So you're make, making measurement A on the side A and measurement B on side B. In the particular case where this is a product, so this will be trace of E, A, I, E, B, J, and this is a row one, A, row two, B. Remember that uh, um, you have to take the, um, well, this is really easier to, to see it in the graphical formalism. You have row one is measured with E one. 
and then uh, row two is measured with uh, E2. And so this is just uh, the product of the two expressions. It's trace of E uh, A I, so this is I, this is J, row one times trace of uh, E J rho. So the point is that this is just the product of the two probabilities. So by definition, when your probability is a product, your joint probability is the product of the two marginals. That's when you have no correlation. So you can say that what is going on on this side is independent of what is going on on that side. So the the point is that. Uh, these connected graphs correspond to uh, uncorrelated systems or processes, and will give you um, um, will give you uh, um, uncorrelated probabilities if you make independent measurements. So the thing is uh, uh, is um, when we describe a process across time, the situation where there is no correlation between different time steps is the situation where our process is a product for things that happen at the different time steps. With the graphically, just means we have these independent blocks. Um, and the non-Markovian process, on the other hand, is something that it cannot be written in this form. And so, uh, at the um, at the problem solving, solving uh, the problem solving session, what we will do is uh, discuss uh, the difference between processes with the uh, quantum or classical memory. I will just give the definition here, and we will go back. To this tomorrow. So a process has classical memory if it's just a sum of uh, Markovian processes. And uh, so this is classical memory. And quantum memory if uh, uh, cannot be written in that form. Um, memory. W cannot be written as a sum J, W, J, M. And the reason for this definition is that uh, uh, if you're just taking a, a, a sum, remember that sums in this, in this formalism correspond to probabilistic mixtures. So this roughly corresponds to a scenario where with some probability you have uh, one Markovian process, with some probability you have some other Markovian process, which you can interpret as there is some classical variable that tells you uh, how to correlate this transformation at different times. Well, if you have a, a quantum system that cannot be uh, described as a quantum variable, um, then uh, um, then you will not be able to, to write it in this form. So um, yeah, you can take this as a definition, and uh, we discuss we'll discuss more about this tomorrow. So okay, I'm uh, roughly at the end of my material. The, um, I think we still have uh, um, some ten minutes. Is it right? So what I can do is, uh, um, so I don't want to, uh, to introduce new, new material, but uh, um, I would like, if possible, to, to try to uh, solve uh, various doubts, because I think this might be a bit, uh, bit condensed. Um, okay, let's, let's make me uh, write a summary. Um, So in the uh, in the Choi representation, a stochastic process, a quantum stochastic process, is described by a process matrix which is positive and has some more normalization condition. I I won't go into the detail. And the joint probability for observing something at time, let's say, t1, t2 is given by the trace of m t1 t2 times w and, uh, and uh, the representation is that w itself is this object here and all these legs we can interpret as uh, um, the input and output space of local laboratories so a i a o b i b o these are all the spaces of density matrices of states um, and this M uh, represents the measurements 
uh, at different points. B I B O. So maybe the one thing uh, uh, we can do is to so okay. Are there questions? Because I can maybe go through some examples. But uh, if there is some some more clear question, we can uh, we can uh, go through that. So. Um, so I'm sure that there must be some aspect of this that you don't find convincing because it's uh, it's not very standard. So yeah, I, if um, if you can voice any any doubt of what is not very clear, does anybody know what is a partial trace? Uh, is the silence yes or the silence for no? Uh, 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 hands for who knows what is a partial trace? Um, most people. I mean, you don't know. <laughs> no, sorry, I'm joking. Okay, so right. So you know what is a partial trace? Uh, I. The diagonal elements. Yeah, the diagonal elements stay the same. Yeah. Right. So a partial trace would be some of the diagonal elements stay the same. So. So okay. First the the picture and then the formula. The picture is the following. You have uh, um. Smiley face. Um, smiley face. Yes. So uh, the partial trace uh, makes sense where you have uh, um, a bipartite uh, operator, so a matrix that you can think as living in the tensor product of two Hilbert spaces. Uh, so let's label the two spaces A and B. And let's think that this is a, um, a density matrix. The formula, of course, is general for linear algebra. Now the, uh, the pictorial representation is this. Uh, if we take the partial trace over B, we get back a density matrix over A. Okay, so partial trace physically means we have this bipartite state and we ignore one side of it. And uh, uh, it's uh, similar to a marg marg uh, marginalization of a joint probability. So if probability for A and B, you can sum over all the values of B to get the probability for A. So that's what it represents, is, is the information about A only. And the, um, uh, the formula is, uh, that rho on A only, which is uh, the trace over B of rho A B, is defined as uh, um, sum over J. Um, well, let me write this. I hope it will be clear. So essentially, it, the diagonal elements are given by, if you take uh, some operator rho, you can take the uh, diagonal elements by taking the scalar product with the basis element. Uh, in this case, uh, you only take a basis for the B side. So in particular, if you want to, maybe it's better, if you want to write this as, uh, uh, say, sum over uh, KH of rho. So if you want to write this uh, as a matrix, KH, and then these are, uh, uh, basis elements. This is equal to um, sum over uh, kh um, and j of k, uh, j, uh, k and b, rho a b, um, h, a, a J B times K H. So essentially you have, a, a, you take, so the, the general bipartite state will have a matrix uh, that is defined by four indices, two for uh, the system to the left and two for the system to the right. And in the partial trace to make, you take the two indices to the right the same and you sum them over and you're left with just two indices that are represent the matrix that are left with on the on the left. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So 
So the, the reason I'm, I'm going through partial trace because that's what represents marginalization, which is one of the, uh, of the standard things that we have to uh, care about. And uh, uh, typically this, uh, the process itself will be obtained by doing some partial trace of some underlying object. So the underlying object that describes the full evolution is something where, uh, uh, as I was describing, you take some joint state, you take evolution, and then you do this many times, and then you take the trace afterwards. And now uh, in the Troy representation, uh, you have to imagine that each of these lines represents a subsystem. So the crucial step here is that instead of when we're describing one system evolving in time, is mapped to uh, uh, a big state where we have uh, uh, one subsystem for each input state and one subsystem for each output state. Okay, so this uh, uh, in the Troy representation, this is AI, AO, BI, BO. This is mapped to some W, which has one leg for AI, one leg for AO, one leg for BI, one leg for BO. And, uh, and um, the probability is obtained when we trace this with the, uh, with the measurement operator. Okay, so, so conceptually, that's what we're doing is we are, uh, instead of saying we have one system that evolves in time, we describe it as uh, uh, a composite system where uh, for uh, each uh, time step, we have an input and an output space. And, uh, and uh, uh, we can calculate this, uh, this joint probabilities by taking this, uh, um, uh, this common trace. And uh, so this is the way uh, that we can link this to the underlying evolution is because if we, if we know what is, uh, say, the initial, uh, initial states and then all the unitary evolution at the various time steps, uh, then we can combine, uh, um, we can find these operators by combining uh, all those. Each combination corresponds to a partial trace on the, on the line we, uh, we are uh, joining over. And then finally, we'll uh, trace out these two, uh, these two things and we get a description of our process. So um, uh, this is something uh, um, I will explain again in more detail uh, uh, tomorrow on the problem solving session. Uh, what I would like to do is to work, uh, walk you through one particular example of how to construct the, uh, the process operator for uh, uh, some particular case where you have a system interacting with an environment. Um, and in particular, uh, we look at the case uh, where one can show that the, uh, uh, the final process has a classical memory, which is something that uh, is not uh, uh, at all intuitive if I just give you the, uh, the description of the dynamics. Um, so this is what we will do at the, at the solving session. And, uh, there will be several steps, and uh, uh, I think you can, uh, uh, you can solve uh, any, any partial step, and this will still be a good exercise. Uh, at the next lecture, uh, um, tomorrow, I will not use a lot uh, of uh, this machinery. So uh, this is just trying to give a, a rather um, complete introduction to the whole uh, uh, thing. But then uh, at the next lecture, I will go back to a bit more conceptual uh, aspects uh, trying to describe superposition of causal order. I will go back to a bit more intuitive pictures. I will still link a little bit to the formalism, but uh, uh, it will still be, uh, I think, accessible even if uh, uh, you don't get the fine details of uh, anything that is going on here. So I think we can uh, uh, leave it at that for today, and thank you for the attention. <laughs>